Hello, good evening, and welcome to Livestream Monday. So today we are going to talk a little bit about creating practical celebrations. Now, if you think back, uh, a couple weeks ago we did a little talk, we chatted about um, creating a practical book of shadows and the difference between a practical book of shadows and kind of like your average book of shadows that everybody else is creating. Uh, when I'm talking about creating practical celebrations, I am talking about creating celebrations that will work for you. I am talking about creating uh, celebrations that you will be able to easily do. Um, and when I mention celebrations, for the most part, I'm, today I'm going to be talking about celebrations, meaning like Sabbath celebrations. And we've got Samhain coming up next week. I think I think it's next week. I'm going to start talking a little bit about Samhain and some ideas and themes to celebrate Samhain. Uh, but so today when I'm referring to the idea and the word celebration, I'm kind of mostly referring to Sabbath celebrations. There are, you can have full moon celebrations. You can, you'll be able to apply a lot of these things to a lot of not even, not even just witchy celebrations, but if you do Thanksgiving or if you do Christmas at your house, if you do some secular stuff, it's funny. I, I consider Christmas secular because I still, I can still uh, celebrate Christmas. But so I'm going to talk about um, some steps to create some things to consider about creating a practical celebration and why it's important to think about these steps. And I'm going to talk about the one question that a lot of people don't ask themselves when they're creating a celebration, when they're creating a ritual, especially. All right. So just as a reminder, at the end of this month, I'm going to be launching the Independent Witch Program, in which part of that is going to be going deeper into themes and creating celebrations. So uh, we'll talk, we, we go a little bit more, more deep, deeper, more deeply. I know I probably should know the correct verbiage of that. But we go deeper in that program, and I actually have templates that you could use to help create your own um, celebrations, your, your own rituals and stuff. But today, we're just going to talk about creating a practical celebration. So, like, why is that even important? Why am I even denoting this, like, as a practical celebration? Because a practical celebration sets you up for success. It doesn't... It doesn't kind of set you up to for failure. Uh, we all have busy lives. We sometimes can get caught up in like our intentions and like, I have this intention to do this amazing Samhain ritual and I'm gonna invite 40 people and it's gonna be beautiful and amazing. But sometimes our intentions are a little bit hard to execute. So today I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some, um, some things to consider and some expectations to manage so that you'll be able to actually create a meaningful celebration going forward. And a celebration might mean a ritual. It might mean a dinner. It might mean activities without an actual ritual. Uh, everybody has a different idea of what they want their celebration to be. Some people enjoy ritual a lot. Some people don't like ritual at all and they just kind of want to do some activities or they want to host a dinner party uh, to celebrate the Sabbaths. It's all great, it's all celebratory, and I wanna talk about all of those things. So another reason why it's important is because sometimes we have so many ideas and not enough time. Like if you're like me, you have Pinterest boards for like every Sabbath, like I have one for Samhain. I'm, maybe I'll post the link to all my Pinterest boards, but you can find me. I'm pretty sure I'm Coach Ivy Rose on there. Uh, but I have like a Samhain Pinterest board and a, a star Pinterest board and all of these Pinterest boards. And there's like a smorgasbord of all of these ideas. And I wanna do all of them because all of them seem amazing and fun and awesome and cool. But like, I don't, I work. <laughs> I have a day job. Um, I, I, I have a lot of other things going on so I can't do every single activity I would like to do. Uh, and we want to make sure we manage our own expectations of ourselves because we don't want to come away disappointed. So to start out, the first thing that you want to do in creating any sort of practical celebration is to connect with, with like the goal first. Like what is the theme 
or the intention that you want to connect with. So for example, for Maybon, we have like the, the major theme is gratitude. We also have um, the equinox and balance as a theme to connect with. We have, there are, there are several themes. I probably would think that there's maybe two or three themes for each major pagan holiday for each Sabbath. So for example, for Samhain, uh, the main thing that most people use in their celebrations is ancestor work. And then we also have like the darkening of the year. We have endings. We have the veil thinning between the worlds. So we have several, several different, um, hi Nadia. We have several different um, themes that we can work with for them. And, and I'm gonna go over all of these themes next week and uh, we'll talk about those next week. But you can see there are many different themes for every uh, like pagan Sabbath, witchy celebration. So the first thing is to kind of decide what theme you wanna create create your celebration around. What's really cool, if you focus on one theme and you're not trying to spread yourself super thin and like, I wanna connect with all the themes. If you connect with one theme, you can go deep into that theme. And you're not going to be like, I'm connecting with all of the things. Uh, and it's fine if you just choose one theme, even if you like all of the themes, because the crazy thing is, whatever Sabbath you're celebrating, it comes around next year and you could do the different theme, the other theme that you didn't do next year. Okay, so initial considerations. These are some things that you want to think about when you're creating your celebration. How much time do you actually have? Not how much time do you want to have in your brain, but how much time do you actually have? So think about the time between now and the celebration or when you start planning and the actual celebration. So I'm not just talking about, hey, I've got six hours that I want to do my celebration for because you, you're going to probably want to do some prep. So think about how much time you have to plan and prep and the time in addition to the time that you will actually do the celebration. Uh, another consideration is where are you going to do it? Are you going to do it at your house? Are you going to do it inside, outside? Are you going to do it at a park? Do you have a friend's house? If you're doing an open ritual or an open celebration, do you have a shop that you want to uh, celebrate at? Do you have a park in mind? Do you have a UU church near you that you're going to rent out? There are a lot of different venues available to you and where you're going to have it is going to, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, is going to have a giant influence on what you can actually do and what you can't do. Another consideration is who is going to be involved? Is this just going to be you? Are you going to do a quiet celebration in your own apartment by yourself? Do you want to get your family involved? Do you want to get your kids involved? Do you have some friends who are interested? Do you want to do an open event? Do you want to invite other people in the pagan community? Because the way you're going to plan your event, it's, it's really going to depend on what, what you're actually planning on doing in your celebration is going to depend on who you're actually going to involve. Because you're going, if you are doing a celebration for eight adults, it's going to be very different than if you're going to do a celebration for you and two or three kids, or you and your husband and a couple kids, or just by yourself. Um, the activities are going to, you're going to want to do them differently. Uh, even if you do the same activity, there are different ways that you can do that for your family and for a group in a group, um, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. I'm gonna get back to my like outline here, okay. So, and then do you want to actually do a ritual? Ritual isn't for everybody. Uh, if you do wanna do a ritual, uh, what do you wanna include in your ritual? Do you want to cast a circle and call quarters and evoke the gods like in a, like, like a Wiccan sort of framework for your ritual? Or do you wanna just cast a circle and be pretty chill for your ritual? Or do you not wanna cast a circle at all? Do you wanna just like maybe set the space, call it sacred and move on? So think about whether you wanna do a ritual. You don't have to do a ritual. I know most books tell you about doing rituals and that's amazing. Ritual is awesome and I love it, but you don't have to do it. If it's not your jam, that's totally fine. That doesn't make you less of a witch. That doesn't make you less spiritual. That doesn't make you 
you know, whatever people might say. <laughs> um, you know, just think about what it is that you actually do want to do. Do you want to do a potluck? Do you want to do a dinner party? Like, what is it that you want to actually do? Do you want to do activities? And I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit in a second about um, some activities and some examples. Uh, okay, so I'm going to return to all of that in a second. So these are things that you probably should think about. How much time you have, where you're going to do it, who is going to be involved, and do you want to do a ritual, a potluck, or just activities? Okay, so here's the one question, the one question that a lot of people don't think about when they are planning their celebrations or their rituals or anything for that matter. The one question is, how do you want to feel? We talk about all the things that we're going to do and we're going to honor these gods and we're going to do this activity and we're going to celebrate the harvest or whatever. But the first question you want to ask yourself is, how do you want to feel? What is that feeling inside of you that you want to have once you've done your celebration? Is it connection? Is it connection with the gods? Is it gratitude for the harvest? And again, you can tie that back to your theme. Is it community? Is it love for your family? Is it um, the excitement of new beginnings or the closure of some endings? So what feeling do you want to feel? I really feel like we don't ask ourselves how we want to feel enough, like in our lives at all. And I'll probably do a live about that <laughs> at some point. But how do you want to feel? Do you want to feel like someone's coming? Do you want to feel connected to your ancestors? Do you want to feel closure with somebody you've lost this year? What, how do you want to feel and allow that feeling? Think about what would make you feel that feeling. So, for example, let's talk again about Samhain, which is October 31st. I'm going to talk about that next week. But if your feeling is you want close, you, you know, you, your grandmother passed away and you want some closure with that, there are different activities that you can do to help you create closure um, for that, for that um, like experience that you're having or if you want to find connection, or if you want to feel excitement, or if you want to access your inner child, like what is that feeling that you want to have when you're done? Think of the theme, think of all the themes that you could do, and then think of how you want to feel. Because how you want to feel can completely influence your uh, celebration in a huge, amazing way. Because if you don't think about how you want to feel and you're just like full steam ahead, I am doing ancestors, and this is these are the five things that we're doing, you can do all of those things and still kind of come away disappointed because you're not feeling the way you wanted to feel. You're not feeling the way you expected to feel. And you need to manage your own expectations. If you don't think about like how you want to feel, you're not going to be able to create, I mean, you, you might be able to, but it's kind of a crapshoot. If you are really considering how you want to feel at the end of your celebration, you're really going to be able to create a celebration that will end with you feeling the way you want to feel. Okay, so we come back to themes. We think about what our goal is, what is our theme, and ask yourself what you can do to honor that theme. So, for example, um, let's talk about, hold on a second, my dog is, bark, is at my door. Let me open the door. Oh my God, hi. Where's your dad? Come on, you're mine now, get up there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> he just wanted in with mommy and he's been like pawing at the door for a couple of minutes and it's a little distracting, so I just let him in. Okay, <laughs> okay, so what can you do to honor the theme? So, <laughs> he's so happy right now. Uh, so ask yourself first what you can do to honor the theme. And the reason why I say ask yourself first is because a lot of us have Pinterest boards and we have all these ideas that we might want to do or we have Google and we can just Google what can I do to honor the ancestors. But to create a practical celebration that is in tune with you and your energy 
and what you want to do and the feeling that you want to feel at the end of it, it's important that you ask yourself first. And this might mean doing a journaling exercise. What do I want to do for Samhain? What do I want to do for Yule? What do I want to do for Mavon or Beltane, wherever it is, whatever celebration you're doing in your world. Um, ask yourself first. <laughs> I'm <be> so happy. <laughs> Okay, sorry, <laughs> your back is sleeping. I know, like he was pawing at the door and he's so patient, he just paws and then he waits. No barking, paw, wait. It's like, I'm talking. I'm trying to think right now, paw, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <coughs> okay, so ask yourself first. Think about what it is you, um, you, you can do that will honor the celebration and that will honor the feeling that you want to feel. Um, so like I said, it could be journaling, it might be meditation, it might just be asking yourself this, actually taking some time to contemplate and just think about it because a lot of us, we're so used to asking, we're so used to looking outside for all of the answers, like what should I do? What have you done? Tell me about your experience. Let me look at your altar inspo. What's going on all the time? <laughs> um, it's hard sometimes to remember that all the answers that we actually need are inside of us. <laughs> he is a sweet boy. Yes, he's in here. Um, <laughs> Cut off the light. Sorry. Jeez. Mm, angry husband. Okay. We are converting our some of the things to smart bulbs. So I keep flipping the light off instead of asking Alexa to do it for me. Sorry. Th evidently, this live stream is full of interruptions. My bad. Uh, I'm good. I'm gonna get kicked out of the uh, witchy coach school. Just kidding. All right. So, ask yourself first. If you don't know where to start, and you're like, I want to ask myself, but like, where do I even start asking for? Like, asking myself what to do. Uh, I'll, I'm just gonna use like Ostara as a suggestion, right? So, if you don't know too much about Ostara, you don't have a huge like idea you haven't been celebrating osara for sixteen thousand years um you're like what can i do you can always go back to symbols so for example for osara we've got you know osara uh the main symbols funny enough it's the same as easter eggs and bunnies so what can you do you know you can do um i know real life practical stuff like look here you want to see real life that is what happens when you're washing dishes 10 minutes before you're supposed to do a live stream. <laughs> like, it's crazy. Mondays are crazy. Okay. So for Ostara, you, if you don't feel like you connect with Ostara, like to me, Ostara is the hardest Sabbath for me to connect with. I can connect with Beltane. I can connect the shit out of like Imolk. That's my jam. But Ostara is hard for me. So sometimes I will look to the symbols, to eggs, to, you know, like Beltane is the main fertility, like all the fertility and sex stuff. But, you know, Ostara, the symbols are like, you know, bunnies and eggs and flowers. And you can come back to that. Th those are a good place to start. So when you're trying to ask yourself, like, what can I do? You can always go back to those symbols. You know, maybe you can hard boil eggs for your dinner party or you can do an egg hunt, which is completely something that we have done in my coven several times. Um, so think about the symbols, think about, um, you know, asking yourself first, you know, just go back to all of that. And then the things that I really want you to think about. So, okay, so we talked about initial considerations. How much time do you have? Where are you gonna do it? Who's gonna be involved? We talk about um, getting down to the actual celebration. How do you wanna feel? You know, ask yourself first. Once you've asked, asked yourself kind of what you're feeling, then allow yourself to go and Google and, and Pinterest. If you're completely drawing a blank because you're super new and you're like, what the fuck, I don't even know what a star is. That's a weird word. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, books are great. Uh, Pinterest is great. You know, you can find a lot on Pinterest. Uh, so after you ask yourself, feel free to go to Pinterest, crowdsource all you want. Always ask yourself first. That is something that you will hear me say all of the time. Like observation, you know, I always go back to like my four foundation skills. Meditation, visualization, 
observation, contemplation. All the answers that you have are inside of you. It's just you need to like be able to like recognize that and access that. And it's easy to forget because like our, our lives are kind of inundating us with like stimuli all the time, you know? And there's a lot of comparison itis also that happens. Oh, that's your celebration. I want my celebration to be like as cool as that or as Instagram worthy as that. It's all of this. And and really all of that is is inside of you. And when you start especially when you start thinking about how you want to feel, it helps you create a more authentic like celebration instead of like is my altar perfect? Because I'm going to take a picture for my Instagram. Uh, and I'm not going to say I haven't been there. <laughs> like, I've done that. I have an Instagram, which coach Ivy Rose, if you don't already follow me. Um, but still, like, you, you want it to connect with yourself first. Even if you're doing it with a group, you're not going to be able to lead or coordinate a, a celebration, Sabbath, whatever uh, thing if you are not connected, if you don't feel like you're going to connect with it. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to some of the things that we talked about in the beginning, initial considerations. Who are you gonna be with? Where are you gonna be? And I'm gonna talk about some practical things. Um, eggs, my anniversary is on Beltane. Yay, congratulations, what a great anniversary to have. Cheers to you, that sounds fun. I probably just build a maple in my backyard and just do it every Beltane just for fun. Okay, so we talked about that. Let's go a little bit more deep into like time and audience and like all of that. So I think I'm going to keep Ostara as a like as an example. So when I say consider your audience, kids, family, group, solitary, right? For Ostara, if you have a bunch of kids, you might want to do an egg hunt. You know, just like our East, the Easter egg hunts we have, if you do an egg hunt, of course, you want to consider allergies and consider the ages of the kids. Cause like, if they're all under two, you don't want to be giving them like stuff that will choke them, et cetera, or candy. If you have, especially if you have kids that are coming in from other families, et cetera, if you're doing a bigger celebration, but if you're just doing your own celebration, you can do an Ostara egg hunt. If you have kids, you can do, um, I have a ton of ideas on my Pinterest thing. You can do like pin the, you can like have an outline of a buddy, a bunny and have them fill the bunny with cotton balls. You can plant seeds with intention. You can um, just honor the changing of the environment with like butterfly stuff, you know, cause, cause we're going from like winter into the spring. It's the first day of spring. You know, you can do all kinds of amazing things, right? With kids. Uh, if you're doing a, something with your family, it's the same thing. You could do stuff for the kids, and then you can also do stuff for the adults. You can do a toast. You could have, like, wine or mimosas for the adults, and you can have, like, um, cider for the kids or, you know, whatever. If you're doing a group thing, it's going to be different than if you're going to do a solitary thing because with group ritual, I'm, just, I'm going to talk about ritual, um, you can what you what you're doing is you want everybody in the group to be involved in most of the activity that you're doing whether it's just an activity or whether you're doing it as part of a ritual or whatever everybody in the group needs to be part of it they do not want to be spectators like i don't know if you're like me but i've been to a lot of public ritual and a lot of it is just um which i consider to be Poor public ritual is a lot of the people just like I'm doing the thing because I'm in the group doing the ritual and everybody else is just standing around staring at the people that are doing the ritual when do I get to sit down <laughs> when is this going to end uh, yeah like I was part of an immolk ritual once that was like two hours of standing and I'm like I just want to sit down it's so cold because <laughs> it was outside um, but like when you're doing a ritual with a group, you want everybody to be involved and you want to allow for everybody to do whatever activity it is. So it could be dying eggs. It could, it could still be an egg hunt. It doesn't matter if you're doing adults. Like I, we had my group, we hosted a sister group at the time 
and we did an Ostara ritual, and afterwards we did an egg hunt, me and the maiden of the group. It was actually at her house. We, the night before I spent the night, we had um, filled a bunch of eggs with candy and jewelry and crystals and this and that, and we hid all of the eggs all over the all over the backyard. So we had an, a grown up egg hunt. So that's like a thing, you know? So, but of course it was crystals and jewelry and like fun things and not like goldfish crackers because you have to know your audience, right? So consider your audience when you're making your actual activity decisions. Uh, if you're doing a group thing, if you, you can have everybody speak once about something, if it's gratitude, like share something you're grateful about or you know, come forward and, and burn something, or you just need to make sure that it is not like, this is my house and I'm doing this and now everybody's watching me do all the things. Like, that is not, nobody's gonna wanna watch you do all the things. Nobody's going to watch you, want to watch you do that. That, that is like the worst thing that you could do because again, they're just standing around. If they're standing around time, and you know what I'm probably gonna do, write this down. This is like the most distracted live. I'm sorry, but I'm going to um, write this down. Um, I want to do a thing about group celebrations because there are different ways to handle lulls. Lulls. That's a weird word, lulls, in uh, group celebrations, right? So you want to make sure that people are doing something most of the time if they're part, part of a group. It could be walking around in a circle. It could be singing a song. It could be doing all kinds of things, but... Um, consider your audience because what you're going to do for your two and seven year old is not even going to fly with a 16 and 14 year old and it's definitely not going to fly if you have five of your friends over so consider your audience and then consider your environment also um, are you going to do it indoors are you going to do it outdoors think about the temperature if you are doing something if you're doing lunasa in august and you're like in Palm Springs, outdoors might not be the place you want to be um, unless you've got misters and canopies and all of like the things that will keep people from falling over. <laughs> um, think about, are you going to be indoors or are you going to be outdoors? Uh, if you are outdoors, uh, will candles be a problem if you're into candles? If, if you're doing, if your idea is, I want to do a ritual where we light, everybody lights five candles because they represent these things and you are outside. Is it going to be windy? Do you live in a place where there's wind? You know, because you're going to want to kind of come up with a backup plan if it's going to be windy, or you're going to make sure everybody has like a hurricane shield to go over their candles. Um, you know, if you want to do a bonfire and, and it rains, what are you going to do? Are you going to be able to move a fire inside? Are you going to be able to burn whatever it is you want to burn if that's your jam? Um, think about noise levels. If you want to do some cathartic screaming like ritual where you're getting all of the rage out for some reason, like is your suburban backyard the best place to do that? I'll let you decide. I do not think that would be the best place to do that unless, you know, you have a ton of land and your neighbors, you tell your neighbors, please don't call the cops because nobody's getting murdered. And I say all of these things mainly because either I have screwed up <laughs> and done something or I've had to say no to things, you know, in my groups or I've, you know, considered all of these kind of things going on. Uh, and consider your timing. If you are planning on doing a ritual outside in the daytime, you are not going to see your candlelight. I'm you know, unless you were in like some dark place, unless you have like a tent that you're doing your ritual in, which is if you're doing a bunch of candles, that's kind of, you know, you have to think about safety. Also, get yourself a fire extinguisher just in case, but you won't be able to see the flame because it's going to be too bright. Um, if you want to do your ritual at night, make sure you're going to want to make sure you have adequate lighting, if, especially if you're reading from a script. If you're reading from a script and you have like these like low romantic, witchy, amazing light levels, you're going to be like, oh shit, like I can't freaking read. Like, and again, that's why we talk about practical celebrations because, you know, we need to make sure that practicality is part of it. So we're not like disappointed 
when we don't have the feeling that we want to feel at the end of it. So consider your timing, consider your environment, consider your audience. Um, and if you want to do a cathartic screaming ritual, which I'm not saying don't do because God, we never get to yell <laughs> as women. Like we're kind of brought up to like shove everything down, never yell. You don't want to be like hysterical. <laughs> So if you do need to have a cathartic thing, maybe you should go to the beach where it's already loud and scream into the ocean or, you know, I mean, there's wind and, and these crashing waves. Like there's a good environment for everything. You just need to figure that out. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, consider all of these pieces, consider your audience and your environment and your timing, um, and your people and your goal and especially overall consider how you want to feel at the end of your ritual okay and once you do that once you think of all these things write them down if you're a person who wants to write who likes to write things down i like to do like mind mapping i don't know if you ever learned that in school but i like to mind map rituals and come up with ideas i'm actually planning on doing that um my coven has a salmon ritual coming up and uh, I'm getting ready to like start a like a finalizing planning thread. We know we want to do a procession through the streets with our drums, uh, but like we, I want to. We need to finalize that. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to mind map. I'm going to come up with ideas. So write everything down. I always say get blank paper and use fun colors. Get some markers. Uh, I always always say that because it makes everything more fun. If you run out of ideas, switch colors because just that color switch, when you see it writing something down, it might help you come up with more ideas. Uh, I like to mind map and, and, and think about all of those things. Think about everything that, all of these practical things that can kind of um, affect your celebration. And above all, like I said, come back to the theme and like how you want to feel. Do you want to feel connected with your ancestors? Do you want to feel excited about the new beginnings at Ostara um, or Imolk? Do you want to feel connected to the energies of Bridget at Imolk, which is also Bridget Day, Bridget's Day? Do you want to feel connected to the sun and the energy and the heat at summer solstice? Or do you want to, to think about, do you want to feel connected with like the first harvest and kind of considering the rest of your year and what can you can do at Lunasa or Lamas? Uh, belting do you want to feel connected with the earth and all this like luscious green energy that is happening and once you really figure out how you want to feel at the end of your ritual it's going to help you plan what you want to actually do so that's all i have do you have any questions at all if you have any questions type in the type in the uh comments if you have any questions i'm just going to talk real quick because i know some people are just joining us we're kind of wrapping up but the replay will be available. So we talk a little bit about what a practical celebration is. We talked about why it's important. We talked about your initial considerations. Where are you going to have it? How's it gonna go? Like how much time do you actually have to prep and actually do your ceremony or your celebration, however you want to do it? Uh, getting down to the actual celebration. What is it that you actually want to do? Considering your audience, considering your environment, considering your timing. Thing, going back and thinking about the theme and the goal you want to connect with and above all how you want to feel at the end of it. So as a reminder, we go more deeply into the themes of the um, Sabbaths in the uh, independent wish program that I'm launching at the end of the month. But, but this is a really good start. If you are new to creating ceremonies or rituals or celebrations, it's important that you do not put too much on yourself. If you put too much on yourself, you're going to get overwhelmed. I mean, you might get overwhelmed and then um, you might just not do it. It might just seem like too much work. So if you know that you have 1 million things, if you have so many responsibilities, you know, like some complex, like multi-layered four part celebration, a ritual and a potluck and an activity and a this and a that and a coffee bar and a, Pinterest worthy altar. Like if, if the idea of that stresses you out, don't fucking do it because don't fucking plan it because you're not going to want to do it. Or 
or if you do do it, you're not going to feel what you want to feel at the end because you're going to be so stressed out about it coming out perfect and it, you know, being what you want it to be. Again, come back to how you want to feel and make it as simple as possible. Let me scroll down. How long on average does it take you to plan a ritual? Now it doesn't take me very much time, but you have to realize I've been doing this for like 20 something years. So it doesn't take me long. Like I know all the themes I have for Sabbaths. I feel like I've done most of the activities, especially since I've been in a coven for 15 years. So that's 15 Ostaras and 15 Imults and 15 everything and one bazillion moon rituals. Um, so it doesn't take me, if I'm going to plan a ritual, I can easily plan a ritual really quickly. I'm actually in a social group and we, we used to meet like a couple times a year and I would come and we'd be like, we're going to be social. And the girls hosting would be like, so we want to do a moon ritual. Can you make that happen in like 15 minutes? And I was like, hell yeah, get me a lighter and a candle and you know, some incense. Let's make this happen. <laughs> like I could, I mean, I could come up with some sort of ritual in five minutes if necessary, but, but you know, it's not, it, I, I'm not going to be able to like think about how I want to feel at the end of it. So when I first started it, it took like a lot of planning and a lot of research because that was important to me. Um, but it doesn't have to, like if I was going to like give somebody advice, like how much time should you set aside to create a ritual? I would say an hour, give yourself an hour to figure out what it is you want. And I'm not talking about writing every like word that you want to say in a script, but like to think about, give yourself the time, gift yourself with the time thinking about how you want to feel and what it is you actually want to do and really think about your audience because that's going to create, that's going to like contribute to a really rich ritual. It's going to contribute to a deepening experience. So you have this good experience and this connection that you are wanting to have and not just like, I am reading something out of a book that somebody else said I should do. Like that was so disappointing to me when I first started, I had a book, I think it was Celtic magic by DJ Conway. Things 1990s. Um, <laughs> and I remember doing my first ritual and like part of it was take your wand, which I don't even know what it was at the time. Like tap on the altar three times, you know, and say something else and tap again for something else. And it didn't explain why I'm tapping. Why am I tapping on the altar with my wand? It, there was no explanation. So there was no deeper meaning. So that's why I'm kind of like really into like get the deeper meaning because without the deeper meaning, like a ritual can become kind of a rut. I read, I actually read a quote today. I have an amazing Google extension called Momentum, sidebar, <laughs> called Momentum. And what it is, it's a super simple extension and it tells you the date and it says like, good morning, Ivy. And it says, what, what is your goal for today? And I will usually like write my intention in there and you just type it. It's pretty simple and chill. And there's like some pretty picture. And at the bottom, there's like some inspirational quote. You can also create a to-do list and stuff. It's super free. If you use Google Chrome, you can check it out. I love it. I even have it at work. And today's little quote at the bottom said, don't let your rituals turn into ruts. And I found that really inspiring, especially since I was doing this talk tonight. And, and if you are just doing a ritual to just be like, this is what I'm supposed to do because I am a robot witch and, and I live my life, <laughs> you know, just, I must do some ritual. I don't have time. So I'm just going to do something somebody else told me to do or something, you know, you're kind of like, um, cheating yourself out of an amazing ritual or celebratory experience because you can connect. You don't even have to be, you don't have to like do a ritual. You don't have to cast circle. You don't have to do like what people think of as pagan ritual. You can just call the spaces sacred. Make sure you turn off all of your distractions, light some candles, go within, do some meditation. And then like do whatever activity you have decided will connect you with the theme and the energy and the spirit of of the holiday or, or the moon or whatever. That's so much better than doing something out of a book because somebody told you how to do it. And that's pretty much why I started the independent witch program because when you're doing some thing that somebody else said, like some other spell that somebody wrote in a book, I could write a spell. I could write a spell for you in five seconds. Does that mean I've tried it? Does that mean that's going to work for you? I mean, 
it's so much all about like what you are doing inside of yourself and connecting and everything is so personal on a witchy path in my opinion that it's important to really consider all of these things and and go inward before you start seeking like outside counsel about what should I do what should I do um, I have a blog post on my blog which is on my website ivyrosatchford.com and I think I named it like sign signs everywhere is a sign because <laughs> everybody's like I saw a black feather what does that mean well what does it mean to you did you ask yourself what that means before you start asking people what it means just because somebody says a black feather harkens a bad day doesn't mean that a black feather harkens a black day a bad day so it's all it's all about like your connection to the the celebration your connection to the themes and and creating something that is going to help you establish a deeper connection and when you do something that is like that somebody else says or somebody else does and you're not feeling super called to it but you're just doing it you're you're doing what what that quote that I saw today says is you're letting your rituals kind of become ruts and you don't want to do that I mean unless you do that's up to you that's not my jam when I do rituals or ceremonies or potlucks or feast days or however you want to call it my coven last month last month oh my god I'm try it's still October okay that's good uh, we did Maybon and we did like a gratitude feasting ritual. So we included the feasting as part of our ritual, which is not something we've done before, but it's something that allowed us to connect with the theme of the holiday, um, which is gratitude and kind of the pagan Thanksgiving, which is Maybon, right? So it helped us connect with that and, and it helped us connect with each other in a deeper way, which is kind of the feeling that we wanted to have, we wanted to feel at the end. So it's a lot about thinking about how you want to feel at the end of your celebration. And if you don't think about that and you just do whatever you're like, you think you should do or whatever's on your Pinterest board or whatever the book says you should do, you might feel like disappointed at the end of it because you don't really think about the themes and how you want to feel about those themes. Do you want to feel connected? Do you want to feel aligned with the energy? Do you want to feel... You know like you like new beginnings like are you excited or or do you want to feel closure like we were talking about Samhain so it's all about how you want to actually feel and then you can build your ritual or, or your celebration around it again you don't have to do a ritual build your celebration around it consider all of those things all of those practical pain in the ass things that I talked about if you're in a suburban suburban area you're probably not going to do a cathartic cathartic screaming ritual Unless you have a plan, you can do that. Far, you know, far be it for me to like say that you can't do it, but you'll want to have a plan to deal with the cops when the cops come, because they probably will, because your neighbors will think you're dying or whatever. Uh, so make sure you ha you're kind of coming from a practical mindset because you don't want to have to stress out about it. What if the cops come? What if this happens? You know, I want to light candles in the park. Um, it, you know, for example, if this happened, I have. <laughs> Um, I did a ritual with a group in a park with candles and we got the cops called on us by a person who thought we were worshiping the devil and the cops came, you know, I ended up wrapping that ritual up a little bit quicker than I wanted. We kind of took some things out so we could be packed up and on our way, like beginning to get on our way before the cops came. The cops came, they're pretty bummed out because the guy said there are naked witches dancing in the park and there were no naked witches dancing in the park. We, uh, we had just lit some candles and, uh. That was a really interesting experience for me but you know but if you're gonna light candles in a park you need to how you will want to have a plan to how to deal with what if the cops come because you don't want to spend the whole ritual like are we gonna get in trouble are the cops gonna come like this and that like you, you know if you're doing a cathartic screaming ritual in your suburban area oh my god what if the cops come when you have all of that all of that stress and all that oh my gosh what happens if what happens if it's going to like disallow you from actually connecting with the ritual and enjoying yourself. So again, always come back to how you want to feel. So I think that's it. Uh, so that's it. It's almost 45 minutes in. I thought this one was going to be shorter. I think I always say that every week. Um, 
So I hope you enjoyed this. Next week, I think we're going to talk about Samhain and the themes and ideas of what you can do for Samhain. Uh, it's, it's Samhain is sometimes considered the new year. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about the darker part of the year and uh, all kinds of good stuff. I'm really excited about the Samhain one. It might be longer than 45 minutes because Samhain is such kind of a big witchy holiday and there's so much we can do and we can talk about the Day of the Dead and all good things. So I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your Monday and I will see you in the group. Okay, bye.